all the different stakeholders who are really working within that, that, that sector, within residential care sector. Um, it was designed so that we could interface with the donor community and particularly the faith-based donor community in Australia who were supporting orphanages as well as interface with Australian-based organisations who are running residential care and also local partners who are running orphanages on the ground because we realised that all of those kind of stakeholders, it was together that they were creating um, this sector, this industry. And without addressing all the different stakeholders, we really couldn't unlock the issue and we really couldn't help all of the partners engage in the change because they were all a little bit scared of each other. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit more soon. But um, so we... We realised when we were in Cambodia that we'd have these conversations with orphanage directors and we'd try to help them realise why there were better ways. And sometimes we'd get to the point of them saying, you're right, we recognise that, you know, orphanages can't provide for children the way families can, but if I change, I'm going to lose all my donors. And then I, what am I going to do? How am I supposed to support my, how am I supposed to pay my staff? How am I supposed to, you know, keep the orphanage running whilst we do reintegrate children into families? And so we realised that donors have a lot of power in this debate. But donors don't necessarily realise how much power they have in this debate. They think that they are coming alongside to support something that's already established and, and a vision that's already been set and determined. They don't actually realise that they're critical and influencing the direction of the vision. So that's why we realise just how crucial it is to do the same level of education that we're doing with projects. We don't just do the same thing back with the donor community or with them. Um, you know, the community in Australia that's engaging with it, whether that is through donations or whether that is through sending teams or volunteers to work within orphanages. So we realised that it needed to be a bit bigger picture and we really needed to try to create almost, you know, a movement change because I'm not sure how it is in the church in the States in Australia. It's almost often synonymous with development. Um, people... You know, when they think about children in, in crisis situations, everyone's mind immediately goes to orphanage. That's the natural solution in everyone's minds because it's what we've grown up under in our churches. It's what we've always heard about from the pulpit. It's the solution that's always been presented to us. So it's about trying to challenge what's become, what's been normalised, even though it's actually not the normal solution. It's not the natural solution to children who are experiencing um, crisis situations or adversity. Families are the natural solution, but we've turned it into the natural solution through the way we've spoken about it and promoted it, particularly um, through churches and faith communities. So Connected was really a way to engage with all the different stakeholders to create um, a lot of change about the, the assumptions that people have about these kinds of things. And so now Connected um, is running in, a, in nine countries and we've been working with around about 45 different orphanages or institutions who are now in the process of deinstitutionalisation. Are you familiar with that term? Yep. Yep. So working in that within that process, and they're all across that that sort of spectrum at the moment. We've got groups that are all the way through it out the other side, and have now turned their orphanages into community centres, into early education centres, into community healthcare facilities, um, and we've also got orphanages who are right at the very beginning of their journey, who are just starting the process of getting the workers in and developing all of their um, child and family assessment systems to start looking at which children can go back into community and the process, the good process through which that needs to happen to make sure that it's safe for communities. But so far in the three and a half years Connect has been running, um, we've seen just over 900 children reintegrated back into their families at this point and we've seen uh, four foster care networks established. Now some of them are really, really small still. Some of them are like four families, five families, so they're right at their beginning stages of their journey and some of them are a lot more established than that so that it's, it's quite a, a scope of different things that have been developed. Um, and we've also been able to redirect a lot of organisations and a lot of um, resource away from institutions, which is one of the big things that needs to happen is, is we need to be able to, all the resources being directed to orphanages needs to shift over to developing community-based services because without the development of those services, when children leave orphanages, there's not adequate support for them to remain in their families and the chances of them being replaced in another orphanage is really high. So we've really got to redirect that resource. So we've been able to do that with people who are thinking about starting orphanages or thinking about supporting an orphanage and helping them to realise, hey, your resource for community is actually preventative. It actually stops 
um, the need for children to even be separated from their families and it's a long-term sustainable solution to these issues. So that's sort of what um, Connected has been working towards. Has anyone got any questions you want to ask um, at this point? I don't think I have any right now. We're good for now. Yep, okay, cool. So I might talk a little bit now just about um, donor education more specifically and what it is that we do when we engage with churches. Um, obviously, that, that's the area that you're most interested in is the interface with churches and, and what you can do in that space. And um, so we've done a lot of, obviously, donor education and awareness raising in the faith community in Australia, and we do that by, you know, a, a range of different methods. We do a lot of speaking at conferences, at forums, speaking and preaching in local churches. And, um, you know, we, we will talk to organisations who are running residential care. I'll often go and meet with their boards and do presentations to their boards to help them understand, you know, what different options are out there and what are the effects of these different options. We'll talk to philanthropy groups, to donor groups. We talk to individuals who we hear about who are, you know, wanting to engage with orphanages or wanting to start an orphanage. Um, and what we're doing is really advocating for them to start focusing on supporting family-based care and community programs rather than institutional ones. So with churches, the two things we're really talking about with a church is the two major ways that they engage, and that's financially, how are they financially engaging with the issue of children in adversity? And secondly, how are they sending volunteers and teams? Because we all know that those, those two things go hand in hand. A lot of, a lot of um, churches in particular, when they're looking at what can they support, their decision, one of the things that factors into their decision is, well, how can my church more practically and tangibly engage? If we're going to financially support them, we want to know, can we send teams? What can teams do? How can we get people involved? So those two decisions come hand in hand. Um, and, and both of them play into this issue quite strongly. We know that both of those things, both the funding and the sending of teams, are two one of the two major driving forces behind the use and proliferation of residential care. Um, and so we, we talk a lot about those two things. So we've got, you know, the way we do that is we've got different videos that we've developed that um, look at the issue as a whole issue, but also do case studies about children and their families in different countries where we work and showing you know, the transition that they've gone through from living in an orphanage and what was that was like to now living in a family and the transformation that happens in a child's life when they, when they go from that really institutional setting to a really natural, organic family and community setting and helping people see that there's a really evident difference in a child's development. And there's one story in particular of a little blind boy who spent his first however many years in an orphanage in Cambodia and he was, he was blind, but that was... There was nothing, you know, there was no other um, intellectual development issues, but yet he presented like a child who had severe intellectual disability. All of the self-soothing, um, you know, the rocking, the head banging, the biting, the physical harm, all of those things, they were all a product of being institutionalised. They, um, they were not related to any developmental issues that he had. And when he went into a family after about a year to 18 months of being in a family in, in that community setting, all of those behaviours disappeared and he was able to work through all of those. So we were able to see this really radical transformation of this little boy and it's a really great story to help people see this is the difference between growing up in an orphanage versus growing up um, in a family environment. There is a really significant difference on the development of children. So we use a lot of videos. We also have a couple of donor tools such as we have our due diligence guidelines that we encourage churches to use. So what we find a lot is that Churches give from their heart. They give from their emotions. And a lot of these, you know, these are connected to bigger picture issues where we have to try and get the in-church to really engage their emotions and their intellect together. So helping churches understand what are we supporting? What are we endorsing? And we find over and over in Australia that a lot of churches don't actually know what they've not asked critical questions. Is this program, this project, this organisation actually legally registered? Um, do they have permission from the government to run the programs that they're running? And we know within the orphanage sector that there is, um, you know, in some countries a much higher percentage of illegally running orphanages than there actually are registered ones and legally running ones. In, in one city in Thailand alone, there are 500 unregistered orphanages. There are only 25 registered ones. So those 500 orphanages are operating illegally and they're being supported by Christian organisations, by churches in Western countries who've never asked the question. 
And now if they ask the question, of course they're going to go, well, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't want to support something that's illegal. But it's about asking the questions and knowing what questions to ask. So we, were, we, we developed this due diligence tool and we encourage churches, ask these questions, find out. And if at the end of that you find out that the program you're supporting is operating well to high standards and under the legal requirements of the countries, then great, support them. But if you find out that they're not, then that needs to factor into your decision making. Um, and that alone helps churches to really work out that a lot of the orphanages that they're supporting, they shouldn't be. They're not operating um, to standard and they're not operating legally. Then we also have um, an orphanage checklist. And that's, again, another tool to help churches really understand what are they supporting. So again, it's helping them to put all these issues in context of saying, well, is this a good orphanage? We know that not all orphanages are bad and there is some niche, all of the different stakeholders who are really working within that, that, that sector, within residential care sector. Um, it was designed so that we could interface with the donor community and particularly the faith-based donor community in Australia who are supporting orphanages as well as interface with Australian-based organisations who are running residential care and also local partners who are running orphanages on the ground because we realised that all of those different stakeholders, it was together that they were creating um, this sector, this industry, and without addressing all the different stakeholders, we really couldn't unlock the issue and we really couldn't help all of the partners engage in the change because they were all a little bit scared of each other and we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit more soon. But... Um, so we, we realised when we were in Cambodia that we'd have these conversations with orphanage directors and we'd try to help them realise why there were better ways. And sometimes we'd get to the point of them saying, you're right, we recognise that, you know, orphanages can't provide for children the way families can, but if I change, I'm going to lose all my donors. And then I, what am I going to do? How am I supposed to support my, how am I supposed to pay my staff? How am I supposed to, you know, keep the orphanage running whilst we do reintegrate children into families? And so we realised that donors have a lot of power in this debate. But donors don't necessarily realise how much power they have in this debate. They think that they are coming alongside to support something that's already established and, and a vision that's already been set and determined. They don't actually realise that they're critical and influencing the direction of the vision. So that's why we realise just how crucial it is to do the same level of education that we're doing with projects. We don't just ask doing the same thing back with the donor community or with them. Um, you know, the community in Australia that's engaging with it, whether that is through donations or whether that is through sending teams or volunteers to work within orphanages. So we realised that it needed to be a bit bigger picture and we really needed to try to create almost, you know, a movement change because I'm not sure how it is in the church in the States in Australia. It's almost often synonymous with development. Um, people... You know, when they think about children in, in crisis situations, everyone's mind immediately goes to orphanage. That's the natural solution in everyone's minds because it's what we've grown up under in our churches. It's what we've always heard about from the pulpit. It's the solution that's always been presented to us. So it's about trying to challenge what's become, what's been normalised, even though it's actually not the normal solution. It's not the natural solution to children who are experiencing um, crisis situations or adversity. Families are the natural solution, but we've turned it into the natural solution through the way we've spoken about it and promoted it, particularly um, through churches and faith communities. So Connected was really a way to engage with all the different stakeholders to create um, a lot of change about the, the assumptions that people have about these kinds of things. And so now Connected um, is running in, a, in nine countries and we've been working with around about 45 different orphanages or institutions who are now in the process of deinstitutionalisation. Are you familiar with that term? Yep. Yep. So working in that within that process, and they're all across that that sort of spectrum at the moment. We've got groups that are all the way through it out the other side, and have now turned their orphanages into community centres, into early education centres, into community healthcare facilities, um, and we've also got orphanages who are right at the very beginning of their journey, who are just starting the process of getting the workers in and developing all of their um, child and family assessment systems to start looking at which children can go back into community and the process, the good process through which that needs to happen to make sure that it's safe for communities. But so far in the three and a half years Connect has been running, um, we've seen just over 900 children reintegrated back into their families at this point. 
and we've seen uh, four foster care networks established. Now, some of them are really, really small still. Some of them are like four families, five families, so they're right at their beginning stages of their journey, and some of them are a lot more established than that, so that it's, it's quite a, a scope of different things that have been developed. Um, and we've also been able to redirect a lot of organisations and a lot of um, resource away from institutions, which is one of the big things that needs to happen is, is we need to be able to, all the resources being directed to orphanages needs to shift over to developing community-based services because without the development of those services, when children leave orphanages, there's not adequate support for them to remain in their families and the chances of them being replaced in another orphanage is really high. So we've really got to redirect that resource. So we've been able to do that with people who are thinking about starting orphanages or thinking about supporting an orphanage and helping them to realise, hey, your resource, the community, is actually preventative. It actually stops um, the need for children to even be separated from their families and it's a long-term sustainable solution to these issues. So that's sort of what um, Connected has been working towards. Has anyone got any questions you want to ask um, at this point? I don't think I have any right now. We're good for now. Yep, okay, cool. So I might talk a little bit now just about um, donor education more specifically and what it is that we do when we engage with churches. Um, obviously, that, that's the area that you're most interested in is the interface with churches and, and what you can do in that space. And um, so we've done a lot of, obviously, donor education and awareness raising in the faith community in Australia, and we do that by, you know, a, a range of different methods. We do a lot of speaking at conferences, at forums, speaking and preaching in local churches, and, um, you know, we, we will talk to organisations who are running residential care. I'll often go and meet with their boards and do presentations to their boards to help them understand, you know, what different options are out there and what are the effects of these different options. We'll talk to philanthropy groups, to donor groups. We talk to individuals who we hear about who are, you know, wanting to engage with orphanages or wanting to start an orphanage. Um, and what we're doing is really advocating for them to start focusing on supporting family-based care and community programs rather than institutional ones. So with churches, the two things we're really talking about with a church is the two major ways that they engage, and that's financially. How are they financially engaging with the issue of children in adversity? And secondly, how are they sending volunteers and teams? Because we all know that those, those two things go hand in hand. A lot of, a lot of um, churches in particular, when they're looking at what can they support, their decision, one of the things that factors into their decision is, well, how can my church more practically and tangibly engage? If we're going to financially support them, we want to know, can we send teams? What can teams do? How can we get people involved? So those two decisions come hand in hand. Um, and, and both of them play into this issue quite strongly. We know that both of those things, both the funding and the sending of teams, are two, one of the two major driving forces behind use and proliferation of residential care. Um, and so we, we talk a lot about those two things. So we've got, you know, the way we do that is we've got different videos that we've developed that um, look at the issue as a whole issue, but also do case studies about children and their families in different countries where we work and showing you know, the transition that they've gone through from living in an orphanage and what was that was like to now living in a family and the transformation that happens in a child's life when they, when they go from that really institutional setting to a really natural, organic family and community setting and helping people see that there's a really evident difference in a child's development. And there's one story in particular of a little blind boy who spent his first however many years in an orphanage in Cambodia and he was, he was blind, but that was... There was nothing, you know, there was no other um, intellectual development issues, but yet he presented like a child who had severe intellectual disability. All of the self-soothing, um, you know, the rocking, the head banging, the biting, the physical harm, all of those things, they were all a product of being institutionalised. They, um, they were not related to any developmental issues that he had. And when he went into a family after about a year to 18 months of being in a family in, in that community setting, all of those behaviours disappeared and he was able to work through all of those. So we were able to see this really radical transformation of this little boy and it's a really great story to help people see this is the difference between growing up in an orphanage versus growing up um, in a family environment. There is a really significant difference on the development of children. So we use a lot of videos. We also have a couple of donor tools such as we have our due diligence guidelines that we encourage churches to use. So what we find a lot is that 
churches give from their heart. They give from their emotions. And a lot of these, you know, these are connected to bigger picture issues where we have to try and get the in church to really engage their emotions and their intellect together. So helping churches understand what are we supporting? What are we endorsing? And we find over and over in Australia that a lot of churches don't actually know what they've not asked critical questions. Is this program, this project, this organisation actually legally registered? Um, do they have permission from the government to run the programs that they're running? And we know within the orphanage sector that there is, um, you know, in some countries a much higher percentage of illegally running orphanages than there actually are registered ones and legally running ones. In, in one city in Thailand alone, there are 500 unregistered orphanages. There are only 25 registered ones. So those 500 orphanages are operating illegally and they're being supported by Christian organisations, by churches in Western countries who've never asked the question. And if they ask the question, of course they're going to go, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to support something that's illegal. But it's about asking the questions and knowing what questions to ask. So we, were, we, we developed this due diligence tool and we encourage churches, ask these questions, find out. And if at the end of that you find out that the program you're supporting is operating well to high standards and under the legal requirements of the countries, then great, support them. But if you find out that they're not, then that needs to factor into your decision making. Um, and that alone helps churches to really work out that a lot of the orphanages that they're supporting, they shouldn't be. They're not operating um, to standard and they're not operating legally. Then we also have um, an orphanage checklist. And that's, again, another tool to help churches really understand what are they supporting. So, again, it's helping them to put all these issues in context of saying, well, is this a good orphanage? We know that not all orphanages are bad and there is some need for residential care as a last resort and as a temporary option of care. But how does a donor work out if that's the way the orphanage they're supporting is actually running? So this, this um, orphanage checklist is really about helping them to ask those questions and work out do they have family-based care options? They make every effort to, to keep a family unit together before they move on to the more drastic action of placing a child in residential care. They, they ask questions and they really evaluate, is this an orphanage that I should be supporting or is this one of those orphanages that actually encourages family separation, which is a really detrimental thing to do. So those are some of the tools we have. And then on the volunteering and the sending of teams note, we have an ethical volunteering fact sheet. And that really just helps answer a lot of the questions and go through some of these concepts about when I send a team over to an orphanage, when is it harmful and when is it actually the right thing to do? And if teams are to go, what can they do that's not going to be detrimental? And what are some alternatives? Because, again, a lot of churches' missions programs have been heavily structured around the way that their teams can engage directly with the programs they support. So if they've got a 10-year history of sending teams over or sending volunteers over to an orphanage once a year and that's been their pattern, then trying to tell them to stop that without giving them alternatives is a really difficult thing to swallow, a really challenging conversation. So it's about presenting the positive options. And what we generally say is that if you're not a stakeholder, and we in our policy define what a stakeholder is really clearly, if you're not a stakeholder, then you shouldn't be visiting an orphanage because it's a child's personal home. And we wouldn't let strangers enter our home in Australia, so we shouldn't be encouraging strangers to enter their home overseas. Now, for us, a stakeholder is someone who's had a long-term, a long-standing relationship with that program and is basically going for the purpose of doing their due diligence checks and maintaining that strong relationship for accountability. That's not a team. It's not, you know, a big group of people who are going to go and, and, and stay in that place for a week or two weeks and, and interact with the children. It might be one or two people. Now, if they take a team with them, we're saying, great, take a team with you. There are other things your team can do that are really positive. You can run sports events in the local community and, yeah, encourage the kids from the orphanage to participate, but also all the other families in the community as well. There's a lot you can do in the community that the children can benefit for. It doesn't have to be in the orphanage, and that way it's not proliferating. It's not, it's not exacerbating all the exploitation that goes on around this issue but it is creating meaningful opportunities that the churches can engage with so that they can continue to, to have some kind of, of an expression of um, teams and volunteers volunteering within the life of their church. So, again, that, that tool, that fact sheet, just helps churches to, 
to try to process through some of those um, different things. Any questions before I talk about what's changed there um, in regards to just the way we've been engaging with donor education? Yeah, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you said when you talk to churches, uh, um, you give them alternatives, but like how else do you word this issue and are careful like not to offend people who have been volunteering and is there, do you cite certain like biblical references or I guess we're just wondering how do we present it in a way that isn't going to offend anybody? Yeah, it's this whole issue is contentious and is, is an exercise in, in um, tactful wording really. So it's, it's, it's really about disarming people at the same time as empowering them. And that's what you want to do. So we're not trying to come in, you know, shaking our finger at anybody and saying, oh, 10 years been ruining children's lives. It's really about saying today's a new day. We've, we've done what we've done in the past based upon the knowledge we've had in the past. Now we've got new knowledge and let's move forward with that new knowledge. We're accountable for what we know. We're accountable to act responsibly with what we know. Today we know this. So today we can move forward with this knowledge and engage with children in, in these kinds of situations in a different way. So we try to almost draw a line, in the, a line in the sand so we're not casting judgment on people and really just talk about how can we reshape, how can we do this better, how can we move forward from here. Um, now, people are still going to connect the dots and go, oh, well, she's saying this and that means I've been doing this. So effectively, she's still judging me. And people will still have that. So it's really just about the way you talk to people and, again, by giving them those really positive and practical options that are alternatives we tend to find is a really effective way of talking to people. Um, and also just not talking specifically about anybody, about any one group or about any really specific activity. So we do that to try to make it a little less personal so people aren't attracted too, too strongly to things that they've specifically done. But what we do really encourage them is to think about what they do. If they're going, what do they do? And one thing we're really strong on is, is telling our churches and our community back in Australia here is if you go, even as a stakeholder, there's no place for volunteers to assume the role of carers in children's lives. Nobody comes in and acts as somebody's mum for a day or a week. That doesn't make any sense. And for you to insert yourself into a child's life, to be their carer for a period of time and then to walk away is to expose that child to really significant harm, um, that cycle of rejection and, and, and you know, attachment and rejection that goes on every time that happens to a child. So we're really strong about that issue. Um, and that's where some people can get a little bit offended because often they have gone over and they have been doing that. That for us is the really key part of that's where the major aspect of harm can come in for individual children. That's where all the exposure to abuse can be really strong. Um, so we do talk quite specifically about that. But again, within a, a bigger picture conversation of talking about all the other positive things that they can do in the community as alternatives for their church. So we've had resistance, we've had criticism, but... To be honest, overwhelmingly, the response has been, oh, my goodness, I wish I'd known this before. Why hadn't I thought about this? This is actually really logical. And that's been the overwhelming response of most people. The closer someone is to the issue, the more personal involvement they've had in the past, the more they're going to struggle and have to process through, you know, what, what they have been involved in and the more they're going to be resistant initially. But most people come to that conclusion with just good information presented in a really factual and non-judgmental way. Perfect. Thank you very much. Ooh, it's okay. Any other questions before we keep chatting? I have a brief question. Sure. Um, you mentioned you have uh, certain checklists, like ethical volunteering checklists. Would that be on your website? I was gonna yeah. Ask. Or website. There's, um, there's a donor tab there and there's also a resource tab and you can find all of those checklists for download and we are more than happy for everybody and anybody who wants to use them to take them away and use them however you feel, however you see fit or whatever opportunity you have and also adapt them you know we we're not precious about our resources it's it's a message that needs to get out far and wide so if you can take that and adapt it to your context to make it more useful then go ahead and do that thank you right um so i guess just in terms of change you know we've Obviously, as I said before, we've been doing this for about three and a half, four years now, this Connected program, and we have seen a lot of really positive change within our sphere. It's 
it's one of those things where you feel like it's a drop in the ocean because the issue is so big. But um, if you look at it again within your sphere rather than within the whole, the whole massive issue, if you look at it from within your sphere of influence, change is really possible. And we have seen some really positive and significant changes in our movement. Um, and amongst our donor community as well as amongst, you know, our practitioner community that's working in different countries. So it is it's um, it is a really worthwhile conversation to engage with. And there's different lessons that I've learned along the way. And there's another document that I can um, make available to you for anyone who's interested where we really look at over the last, over the three years, the first three years of the Connected program, what lessons did we learn? Um, what trends were we able to identify? Because... I guess the, the first part of that three-year period was really and engagement of stakeholders rather than the actual programming. So Connected does both. Connected, you know, goes through the whole conversations and helping people process the issue. And then secondly, Connected provides the technical support so that organisations can actually engage in change. So all of the, you know, the social worker training, all of the structuring, deinstitutionalisation pathways and all of that more technical aspect. So we do both. But the first probably year and a half was really focused quite strongly on the, the stakeholder engagement. And what we noticed is there is really strong trends that come about how to communicate to different stakeholders. Talking to a founder, an orphanage founder, is a very different conversation to talking to the board of an organisation. And it's a very different conversation to talking to a donor in a church. And it's a different conversation to talking to a local pastor who runs an orphanage overseas. Because what we really need to understand is all of their motivations are different. And I'm not saying there's, you know, black and white, good and bad motivations, but everybody's in this for a different reason. And I think sometimes we come at this from one angle only. We come at this from a very um, what is in the best interest of children angle. And all of our communication is tailored towards what's in the best interest of children. Now, that absolutely is the key to this. What is in the best interest of children? But we need to understand that that's not always everybody else's motivation. There's other things. There's other reasons why they're involved in this. Um, and we need to be able to identify and speak to their motivation in order to actually help them embrace change because everyone comes into this conversation with a filter. And that filter is what am, why am I doing this and what do I stand to lose? And if you can't speak to that filter and help them process through that, then everything else you say in that conversation is getting lost along the way. And that's something that came, became really, really clear the more we did this is my first 15 to 20 minutes of talking to somebody is about working out, okay, who are you in this picture? Why are you in this? What are you doing? And from there, you can really structure and tailor your communication message to be more effective. So I'm not saying that everybody can be categorised, but there are some really clear trends that have been emerging um, over time. And I won't go into what all they are right now, but I can make that available to you if, if you're interested and, and sort of want to, get a bit of a head start in talking to the different people you might engage with in your churches. Um, one last thing I just wanted to, to touch on is that one other lesson that we've really learned here is that this is not, the issue of orphanages and orphanage tourism and volunteering is not an isolated issue. It's actually, we find a part of a bigger picture issue. It's a part of, it's almost like an expression of, the mindsets and the assumptions that we have and that we develop in local churches around missions and development as a whole. And we find that um, particularly, you know, through the way that we promote missions, the way we speak about it from our pulpits and our platforms in churches, we're creating a mindset, we're creating an understanding about what development is, what good practice is or, or what, what normal practice is. And it's out of that, those, those norms that we're developing in our churches that all of this behaviour comes. So when someone in a church grows up and every time it's Mission Sunday they hear about an orphanage, well, they grow up thinking that's the norm, that that's what missions like. They grow up, go out and do missions, well, they automatically think of going to an orphanage. When they get enough money to be able to support an overseas project, well, they automatically think about supporting an orphanage because that's the norm that's been created in their whole experience of learning about missions development through their local church. So there's a lot of big picture issues that actually need to be unpacked for churches to really engage differently um, with is this issue. So we've found that sometimes, although I want to talk about the orphanage issue, I've got to step back with a church or with, uh, with our denomination as a whole. And I've actually got to talk about some other issues. So I'm not just telling them what is ethical you know, what to do that is ethical. What does ethical volunteering look like? It's this activity versus this activity. I actually need to step back and say, why? Why are some things ethical and why are other things not ethical? Why is this behaviour 
positive and why is this behavior detrimental? And if I don't step back and look at the why, there's two things that will happen. Some people will just say, well, I don't agree with your what because I haven't given them enough background. And others will jump from one bad action to the next bad action and they'll just jump from orphanage tourism to trafficking shelter tourism instead. And they, because they haven't got the context to reevaluate and critically think through the decisions they're making and actually make better choices. So we found that we've had to step back, broaden the conversation um, and actually start talking to some of the underlying assumptions and underlying issues that feed into how we engage with these things overseas. Because it is a big paradigm shift. And just to touch on what some of those things are, things like notions of, of superiority, how we talk about missions in, in faith-based communities or in church spaces from the platform, how does it deal with this issue of equality? Are we going to fail or are we going to empower people? Are we going to learn from people? Are we going to teach people? And all of these wordings and all of these things reveal notions of superiority we often carry with us when we go to engage with missions and development overseas, either through the way we give, the way we structure programs, or the way that we go to volunteer. So really looking at that issue of superiority, charity, the notion of charity. Are people, are people, um, are they the passive recipients of our charity or are they active participants in their own development? How do we talk about beneficiaries? How do we talk about local communities in our church? Do we talk about them as, as the people that need to be saved by us, helped by us, developed by us? Or do we talk about them as people with people who have capacity to self-determine their own development, to, to drive the, the, the course of their own life and a journey that, that we can then become a part of rather than a journey that we drive or we speak about as if we are driving and controlling. There's the issue of colonialism, um, which is far from dead and, and is really quite evident in, in a lot of the development sector um, and in the, the way that, sh that faith-based communities engage with development. Are we still perpetuating those, those unequal relationships that, that are reflected in colonialism? Um, oversimplification of development, cause and effects chains. You know, when we stand up in church in a five-minute presentation and say, you know, this is the issue and we're going to do this and it will save it and it will all be okay, we create incredibly oversimplified understandings of what is causing issues that development is addressing overseas. And that is a huge issue because then we create this expectation that things can be fixed so quickly, that things can be fixed so simply and that things that results can be seen so immediately and that affects how people give. It affects the kinds of projects they want to give. All of a sudden, everybody wants to only give to projects that are going to get five-minute results, that are going to result in feedback and newsletters and videos in two months, three months, six months of these radical transformations. But is that actually realistic? When we do that, are we actually warping the whole understanding of development in our attempts to promote development or promote missions from our platforms. So we've had to really take our churches through this journey of thinking through the way they use their platforms to speak about development, to speak about missions and how are the words they use and the way that they're promoting actually creating an understanding in their churches that is flawed and that therefore goes on to all of these flawed behaviours such as engaging in, in volunteering in orphanages and the detriment that we see in that. So I know that that's kind of taken it out and made it a bit bigger picture, but just to, to I guess, introduce the idea that there's a lot of assumptions underneath these kinds of issues that feed into it and, and orphanages and orphanage tourism is one expression of some of these issues and there's others out there as well, but that it's really that, that double-edged um, strategy of, of dealing with the big picture and reshaping the way we think about missions and development all together and the way our faith communities engage all together and out of that we're going to get better expressions of engagement we're going to get better understanding of why orphanage tourism is harmful of why perpetuating the use of long-term residential care facilities is harmful we're going to get better programs we're going to get you know, more educated and more aware donors who engage better with the programs and choose better programs to, to donate to. So it really is worthwhile to get into the fabric of churches and faith communities and start to really challenge the way we use those spaces, the way we communicate within those spaces, because it's not just promotion. It actually is the site where a lot of the faith-based communities develop their understanding of all of these sectors. Does that raise any questions for anybody? 
that's a wow. <laughs> You did a very fantastic job yes. of answering all the questions I had. Yes. <laughs> we came up with probably ten, ten questions <laughs> and pretty much covered it all. <laughs> is there I guess uh, specifically, is there any like specific verse or like biblical reference that you bring up that yeah. supports this cause at all? Yeah, look, we've spent a lot of time on trying to reframe the theology around this because, again, that's important to churches. And um, um, I, I believe that the States is probably a little bit a little bit different because from what I've, I've understood and what I've read, it, it seems like the issue of the orphan care movement is a lot stronger in the States than it is in Australia. But even in Australia, there's a very... Um, it's very evident that the way scripture is used around the issue of orphans and caring for orphans is quite distorted. It's theologically distorted. So it really is important to get back in the faith-based community to a, a biblical basis of this kind of stuff. So one key verse we use all the time is that God sets lonely in families. Um, you know, this whole issue of, of children and adversity, we often put that child, we isolate the child, we you know, the way we take, you know, our images of children, we put this child up by themselves and it creates this issue, this, this image of a vulnerable, isolated, alone child. It makes people feel like there's nobody around that child. There's nobody helping that child. Perpetuates this myth about the numbers of orphans that are out there, which is, which is false. Most of these kids in institutions are not orphans, but those images perpetuate that. But what we try to do is, is say, well, God sets the lonely in family. So even when, when your mental image conjures up this child vulnerable and alone and you equate that with needing an orphanage, God actually says that child needs a family. He says he places that child in a family. So we really look a lot at going back to the biblical design. What did God design? You know, institutions for children we're saying is harmful. What did God create? Well, he created two. He created the family and the church. And they're the two institutions that God created that were designed to, to outwork his social justice mandate. And for children, it was the, the place that he desired children to be cared for. So we talk a lot about that. We also talk a little bit about some of the verses that just touch on caring for the widow and the orphan. And we help churches understand that they're not two categories of people. They're a family unit. If you look back at the historical and the biblical context of those situations, it was an orphan and her widow, not an orphan over here and a widow over here. And the way God instructs us to care for that family is to help them because the widow is the duty bearer. She's the one charged with the duty to care for that child. So the support for the child flows through the family, not directly to the child. And that supports a more community and family-centered approach to, to caring for children. You support the community, you strengthen the family, and that is the best way that you can help that child, not by isolating the child, removing the child, and treating that child as a separate category. So a lot of people use those biblical references to support their institutions to say, well, God told me to care for the, the orphan. He told you to care for the orphan and the widow together as a family unit. That's the way he designed it. So talking about that, there's also the issue of, of adoption, which kind of feeds into this and we won't go too much into, but even the understandings of biblical references about adoption, what are they actually talking about? They're not talking about children. They're not talking about children in poverty. It's talking about, you know, the next the next. Um, you know, legal hair to the throne. It's, it's actually most of the time talking about adopting adults, not even about adopting children. And it's got nothing to do with children and adversity, welfare or child protection issues. It's a completely different thing altogether. So again, a lot of those verses get misconstrued and used to support faith-based communities engaging in, in those kinds of things that are also not always ethical and not always well-structured. Um, and it's about going back and saying, yes, God does talk about caring for the orphan, but there's a context to that, and that context supports family-based care. It doesn't support institutional care. Now, again, I'm not saying that to say that that means that all orphanages should be shut down across the world. Maybe we will get to a point where that can happen. But it does say that the, the first port of call, the way, the most beneficial way we help a child is to help that, that, that family unit, to help the widow and the child. Um, so, yes, we use those kinds of biblical references and, and unpack the the assumptions that have been uh, or the way that they've been used in churches that's distorted we try to help our churches unpack that and re-understand that um, and recalibrate that and then use those bible verses to support family-based care yeah 
thank you so much. A lot of great information. Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. <laughs> so much. All right. Is there anything else you wanted me to explain or give you examples or, or chat you through or have you had enough? <laughs> Do you think it, when we go talk to churches, it's best to stick to like specific examples that help people understand the issue or you were talking about kind of staying away from specific examples not to offend them but at a certain point do you bring up testimonies like your own story to help people understand yeah yeah I think um you know that's where you you if you haven't had the experience of actually working in this context or you know if you don't have um your own story of of that transformation to share lean on other people's testimonies and that's where videos and things like that become really useful because what is disarming for people is it's hard to argue with someone's testimony it's easy to argue with theory there's counter theories and and you know people will say well i don't i don't think that's right but it's hard to argue with someone's story and someone's testimony and that's why we like on, you'll see on the connected website where we have a lot of videos when we go throughout our connected programs we capture a lot of the stories because when a child sits down and tells you that before they used to live in an orphanage and how they wished with all their heart that their donor had helped them stay with their family versus stay in an orphanage, when they say that, who can argue with that? You know, that's their personal story. That's their testimony. And to share that, people can't argue with that. But if you say life for a child is better in a family than an orphanage as a theory, People will come back and say to you, oh, but this community is so poor. Oh, but this country is like this. Oh, but this culture is like this. They abuse children. They do this. They do that. But when the child themselves turns around and says to you, I wish this could have happened for me. I wish I could have lived in a family. You can't argue with that. So testimonies are a very, very, very powerful part of this story. And you can use people's videos. You can share other people's stories. The other thing that's really good to arm yourself with when you're talking to churches um, is understanding that what will get thrown back at you is all the reasons why it's a great idea but will never work. Um, and we hear that all the time where people say, you know, this is great in the West, foster care is great in the West, but it'll never work in, in this country because it's too poor or nobody's going to foster someone else's children. And if people will throw up all these reasons why it's not possible and it's their defence, it's their barriers for why they don't need to take this conversation any further because it's challenging. But the reality is, and what I think is, is a real God thing for me, is that um, we've seen that God has done this in the hardest countries. Cambodia is a tough country to do this in. It's, it's, it's very poor. It's one of the poorest countries in that region. Um, you know, it's had one of the most troublesome histories and backgrounds in that region, yet he did it there. And for our experience with, with, um, with children in families is the first year, the cases that we had to place kids in foster care, they were all challenging cases. They were all the cases that everybody said would never work. Children who are HIV positive, children who had significant physical and intellectual disabilities. All of the kids that people said, it'll never work because you'll never be able to deal with these kinds of kids. And our first year was all about placing kids like that in foster care, in long-term permanent foster care families. Cambodian families, not expat families, rural, normal, average Cambodian families who embrace these kids as their own. And those kinds of stories are really powerful too, where you can say, yes, it's hard. Yes, this is challenging. We're not saying that this is easy. We're not saying this is a problem-free issue, but it can work. It's been demonstrated to work in hard places where all of those obstacles exist. And we find being able to share that because as Westerners, when we share this story, that is a lot of the resistance that we get is this is fine for you in a Western country with all your resource. This won't work for us or this won't work in the country where the orphanage we support is because they're too resource poor. And the reality is it can, it does. It's been demonstrated over and over again that it can work. That seems to be it for our questions. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rebecca, uh, for taking the time. It's uh, it's incredible, and there's no. Um, you were just talking about the power of testimony. There's no uh, capacity I would ever have to deliver that. So thank you for speaking in our class here today, Thursday, from your Friday morning. We appreciate it.
My pleasure. It was lovely to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So and, um, Thank you. Really, really excited to see that there's, you know, people like you over there who are wanting to engage with this and are, are really looking to take this message out to your spheres of influence. All the best with that and, and um, stick at it. I believe you'll see significant change too. Well, thank you Ooh. for all you do too. I'm sorry thank I'm going to do this. I just remembered one question because you used yeah. the term spheres of influence. How do you, you talked about how it was helpful for you to be able to put some demarcation around your sphere of influence to make an assessment of things that moved here. How did you do that for the community you've been working with? What's, what's the sphere you all identify and how, um, do you, how do you put edges around it, I guess? Yeah, I think we started from the closest circle and moved outwards. So initially, I realized that if I was going to take this anywhere, I had to get my own team on board. So I spent six months working just within our organization, you know, within our, our, with our own board, with our own staff, with our own leadership and our organization. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, when we got buy-in there, the next sphere, the next circle out from that was our actual our own mission and development agency so our own field workers our own strategic partners so we took the message to them first and spent you know probably another six months or so just working within that sphere when we from there we then went movement wide that's when we went to the ACC as a as a denomination and took it out from there so for us we kind of identified who do we have direct access to who do we have you know significant access to and then how do we leverage um, people from within those two closer circles to get to the next circle. So, you know, I couldn't necessarily stand up at our national conference um, in front of all of the pastors of the ACC in the whole country, but our, our, one of the people in our direct sphere of influence could. So when he grasped this message, he had the position and the platform and the influence to take that to a bigger place. So it's also about finding people who can champion your message so that you're the message in your sphere is then multiplied um, to get into other people's spheres of influence as well. So that was something that we did is also identify who can champion this, who has a bigger platform and who can take this and how can I equip that person to be able to really speak powerfully about this issue within their sphere of influence. And then it was the partners that we had. So understanding again, those different stakeholders and, and tailoring the messages. So, Partly it's identifying who you can reach and then it's identifying the strategies to reach them because it's, it's really knowing that they, they may, there's multiple stakeholders within any given sphere of influence and they all need to hear this message slightly differently based again upon their motivation. So it was kind of those two issues of who are they as a stakeholder and what sphere of influence are they in and can I get to them personally or can I leverage another champion to get to them? Great. Thank you. Very helpful for what we're working on and thinking about as well. Excellent. And fortunately, we're in the center of the country, so we can just move out. From there. Excellent. Very good. Strategically placed. Right. Um, well, thank you again. And we will, um, I will individually, but I think we will all together check in in a few months and just let you know how we've been able to continue moving forward here. And okay. I think you're, your story is going to be massively helpful for that. Excellent. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the time with you this morning and um, really look forward to hearing yeah, how everybody journeys with this going forward. Very exciting. Have a great thank Friday. Thank you too. See you later.